perfect crime. <laughs> crime. Oh, my wealthy fraternity brothers. $67 and a second-hand typewriter. I told you to leave it alone. No, you were so scared you froze to it. It was the first time, Artie. The next time it'll be all right. If there is a next time. When we made the deal, you said you could take orders. You said you wanted me to command you. I do. As long as you keep your part of the agreement. What was the big idea of that? There was a man in the road. You didn't even see him. Yes, I did. Take it easy, Artie. You'll get us stuck. Hey! All right. Come back here. You drive. Come back here. I want to talk to you. You trying to kill somebody? He's drunk. We better get out of here. Wait a minute. Stop! You're smart, don't you? What? That way. You come back here. I'll show you who's smart. He's asking for it. Give it to him. That's an order, Judd. We almost killed him. Uh, drunk. Would have known about it anyway. It would have been murder. Uh-huh. And you know why I tried it, Jetsy? Because I damn well felt like it. That's why. <laughs> Artie, we're home. Artie. Bam! <laughs> I was just thinking about the fraternity house in the morning. Everybody running around accusing everybody else, nobody knowing it was us. Could you see him, Jetsy? Yeah. Artie, listen. About missing that drunk on the road. Forget it. I'll get another crack at him some night. When I'm alone. Alone? Can you picture those poor saps of the fraternity? You were only fooling about there not being a next time, weren't you? Was I? Please, Artie. 
I'll do anything you say. Anything? I want to do something really dangerous. Something that'll have everybody talking, not just a few guys. With half the fat-headed cops in Chicago running around in circles wondering about it while we sat back and laughed at them, huh? Yes, but together, Artie. Something perfect, something brilliant. The two tested the superior intellect with every little detail worked out. And dangerous, really dangerous. That's the only way to be any fun. Yes. Uh, you'd get panicky again. No, I wouldn't. It must be done as an experiment. Detached, with no emotional involvement. And no reason for it except to show that we can do it. We can do it. Together. Okay, genius. Go home and get some sleep. I'll call you tomorrow. worried about the car and you too and me too that's very touching apparently his concern for me didn't give him insomnia don't be a smart aleck where were you up to some funny business with artie again as if i didn't know then why bother to ask wait a minute i want to talk to you i don't think we have anything in common max and take your hand off my arm i don't have to answer to you or anybody else say hey, kid outside of artie and your birds you don't give a damn about anything else in the world, do you? Does my interest in ornithology annoy you that don't much? Don't be a fool. I'm delighted with your success. It just irritates me to see anyone as brilliant as you make a jackass out of yourself over someone like Artie Strauss. I see. For your information, my dear brother Max, Artie Strauss happens to have one of the most brilliant minds I've ever I had. I know all about talk. Artie Strauss and his mind. Now, I've no doubt you both have twice the brains that I have. I'd just like to see you use them for once on something besides cheating old ladies at bridge and giggling and scheming in your room all afternoon. Don't you ever go to a baseball game or chase girls or anything? When I was your age, I was always out I'm looking. sure you had some fascinating experiences, Max. But some other time. I don't expect any consideration for myself. But Artie happens to be a gentleman. Something I doubt you'd understand. Oh, I understand. Would you like me to tell you something else about him? I think he's a dirty, evil... You keep your filthy mouth shut! I don't have to listen to your insinuation. Shut up, you want to have a whole house. I don't care. Oh, cool down. I know that Artie's your friend, but I'm older than you, and I know what kind of trouble you can get into. I'm, I'm worried about you, me. Judd. Will you listen to me? Judd, listen. Professor McKinnon, I must agree with Nietzsche. Tribal codes and such do not necessarily apply to the leaders of society. No. No, Mr. Stein, I, I can't see where your friend Nietzsche's theories have any application at all here. Hammurabi, Moses, Selwyn, Justinian, they were all known as lawgivers. Actually, my question was whether Moses and the others felt that they themselves had to obey those laws. All men are bound by law, Mr. Steiner. And had Nietzsche been a lawyer instead of a German philosopher, he would have known that too. Are you going to tell me that Moses felt himself above the laws that he laid down for his own people? Oh, I don't know, sir. He had a motley crew on his hands, and he had to get them through the desert somehow. <laughs> Can you cite an example of any of these men who failed to respect the law or the rights of the individual? Uh, can Nietzsche explain that away, Mr. Steiner? Oh, I think so, sir. If you've read him, sir, you'll remember that he conceives the Superman as being detached from such human emotions as anger and greed and lust and the will to power. 
It's all completely beyond my comprehension, although apparently not yours or Nietzsche's. Perhaps my thinking is outmoded, but I still cling to the theory that if we were all super intellects, we would nevertheless evolve our own code of laws. No, super laws, sir. <laughs> well, an alien voice in our midst. And since I haven't heard it before, Mr. Brooks, I am forced to assume that you were not with us earlier in the period. Well, that's just an assumption, sir. It can't be admitted as evidence. Oh, very good, Mr. Brooks. You surprise me. But just for once, I shall take a leaf from Nietzsche's book, place myself above the law, and grade you accordingly. That will be all. <laughs> Every time I stick my neck out, he chops my head off. You get away with murder. How come? I don't know. He just doesn't seem to think very fast. He's supposed to be one of the brightest men in the faculty. I suppose he is. About this Nietzsche stuff, do you really think there are super intellects? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. So then, just Artie? swing into the alley. Bam! This torpedo cuts loose with a 38. <laughs> my ear. Oh, come on, Artie. Cut you it. You think out. I'm kidding? All right, what do you think that is, huh? Well, it looks like a moth hole. Oh, no, Sid. He got that running whiskey in from Canada, just for the fun of it. Yeah, <laughs> sure, just for the fun of it. You don't believe it, huh? All right, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll all go down there tomorrow night, the whole bunch of us, OK? The four deuces. Yeah, okay. Judd, you know the place, don't you? We're almost late now, aren't All right, now, wait a minute. I got to get this set. Sid, you can ask Benny himself about me. He runs the joint on uh, Rush Street, 26. Looks like a store. Mike? Mike, you be there, okay. Sally. Yeah. Pete. Sid, you can bring Ruth, can't you? Well, I, I tell don't you know. What, I'm Sam. supposed to work the late shift at the Globe. So, what time do you get through? Well, no, 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 wait a minute, I tell you what. Just meet us there. I can pick up Ruthie, Judd can. Wait a minute, uh, you know Ruthie Evans, don't you, Judd? Hello. I don't believe I've had the pleasure. You do now, so that's all set, Sid, okay? Yeah, all right, Ruthie? fine. Perhaps Miss Evans would rather wait for Sid. No, I don't mind. Great, we'll That'll meet there fine. at, uh, 9 o'clock. We'll make yeah. it a big celebration. Yeah. Sharp. Yeah. What are we celebrating? Oh, uh, little business deal we got cooking, huh, Judsy? We'd better get going, Artie. OK, what are you hanging around for? Bank job, nothing to it. Open it up with a hairpin. <laughs> yeah. See you later. Oh, that's like talking to a Roman Come candle. I know. Look, how come you told him you'd go? You know, those boys are millionaires' sons. I haven't got that kind of money to throw around. It was Artie's idea. Let him pay. How many times do I have to say it? When I go someplace, I, I like, like to, to pay, pay my, my own, own way. way. I know. OK, I'll starve for a week. Don't worry, Mother will feed you again. Hey, Brooks. Yes, sir. I like it. A good human interest. Have they really got that mouse in the physics lab? Well, they wouldn't have written it if they didn't, sir. Well, who knows? It might be good for a picture on the featured page. Well, I'll get the mouse. Give me a photographer. We'll go oh, up to the lab. Relax. Uh, get one out of the files. I got something else for you to do. There's been a report on a drowned kid that was pulled out of a culvert up in Hagwish Park. Uh, now, here's the dope, and check with Tom Daly before you run off. He's working on a kidnapping, maybe a tie -in. Yes, sir. 10,000. Right. right. 2,020s and uh, 8,050s, right. That's all old bills and all typewritten, Mr. Kessler. Now, Mr. Kessler, of course I won't. The story is safe with me until you give me the word. A Daly, sir. Tom Daly at the Globe. Thank you very much, sir. Kidnapping? Yeah, a guy's afraid we'll run a story and scare the kidnapper off. Big millionaire out in Hyde Park. Well, Ryan wants me to look at a drowned body. You think there's any connection? Well, I doubt it. Kid probably just wandered off. Still with all that dough. Yeah, don't waste any time getting out there. Here's what I've got on the description. And call me back, huh? Right. Brung him in around 8 this morning. Drowned, they said. Hmm. Wait till the coroner sees that report. Why do you say that? This kid wasn't drowned. All them cops wanted to do was dump him on us. Show you something. Hmm. Kid's glasses. And you see this here? Them lumps under the hair? This kid was slugged. See how stiff this is? 
dried blood. What's the matter? Nothing. Glasses. Oh. Now, in my opinion, this boy was hit on the head with a blunt instrument two, three times. Jennings. That was the cause of death. What? Clean wagons, yes. Okay, coming. Look, have you got a phone I could use? Right there. Leave a nickel on the desk. State 1097. Chicago Paul. Tom Daly. Daly. This is Sid. Oh, hello, kid. I'm at the morgue. I think I've got something. The description fits to a T. This boy didn't drown. He was killed, hit over the head with a blunt instrument. All right, listen. Stay right where you are and don't say anything to anybody. I want to see if I can get somebody from the Kessler family to come over with me and make a positive identification. Okay. One more question, sir. Did Paulie wear glasses? Glasses? No, no. Mr. Kessler? You're Mr. Kessler, aren't you? I'm Jonas Kessler, boy's uncle. And there's no question it is your nephew, sir? No, there's, there's no question. Just a minute, I'd ask you more questions. What's that about glasses? Well, they must have been beside the body when they found it. But they weren't the boys. I tried them on him. They didn't fit. Where are they now? I shoved them way down under the sheet. Nobody will notice. You think whoever did it could have dropped them there? Well, I don't know, but if nobody notices them for a little while, we got a clean beat for the morning edition, and you got a bonus. Come on. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Sorry. Can we see the body? Okay. Sure. <laughs> Plato's system, you see. All children would be wards of the state and assured of being educated correctly. Wouldn't that be terribly sad and impersonal? Children do have feelings and emotions, don't they? Of course they do. But for whom? Why should it be their parents? They didn't choose them. I certainly didn't choose mine. It's pure biological accident. You feel that way about your own mother and father? I have very little in common with my father or my mother. My mother died when I was eight years old. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Judge, hey, Bruce, you gotta hear this. Old Sid's the biggest man in town. Hey, Sally, Sam, take a seat, will you? Hey, come on, just sit down. Hey, 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 now, to hear him tell it, it sounds like nothing. But you know about the kidnapping, the little Kessler punk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right about yeah, yeah. yeah. Didn't you notice that every paper in town had to say it was a Globe reporter who found out the kid had been murdered? So, yeah. so who do you think it was? Say it out. He says the hero of the hour. Give me that. Okay, so up I can see Wait a minute, Sydney first. Okay, that's up for you. Okay, okay, everybody, come on. Just sit. Marty, will you sit down? It was just a lucky break. <laughs> Boy, it sure was. You know, if he hadn't identified the body when he did, the Kesslers would have paid the ransom. How about that? Well, what about the paper? Did they give you a bonus? 
Yes, but not for that exactly. You mean there's more? Oh, there's more. Listen, he didn't tell it all. Oh, sure, sure, just tell us, huh? Well, it'll be in the early morning editions. Just another lucky break. How about the glasses? Glasses? What, <clears throat> what do you mean? What kind of glasses? Eyeglasses, you know. The police thought they belonged to the boy, but they looked pretty big to me, so when nobody was around, I tried them on the body. Oh, yeah. oh. Well, I had to. Anyway, they didn't fit, so they couldn't have been his. I didn't say anything to anybody. Did you so... mean they could have belonged to the murderer? Well, the police seem to think it's possible. It's not a very logical conclusion. Anyone could have dropped them. But anybody didn't. They must belong to the murder. Oh, Artie. The bleeding. What set you off? <laughs> I don't know. Wow. <laughs> what they put in that drink anyway? Artie. No. Just uh, wash it off. Gotta get some air. Uh, he really should have that looked at, Judd. Judd. Well, at least he didn't propose another toast. He might have hurt himself badly with that glass. Ah, for a guy who dodges 38 okay. caliber bullets, that's I nothing. Think we'd better get going. Yeah. What's the rush? We've got an early class in the morning. Yeah. You know how it is. Yeah, well, good night. Night. Okay, so we'll night see you later. Good night, Ruth. Somebody night, sure let the air out of this balloon in a hurry. The check. Yeah, the check. 2380. You wouldn't rush off and forget her, would you? This party was on Artie. Which one was he, Miss the Wacky One? There goes the bonus. Thanks, I'll bring you the change. I can't find them. They've got to be here somewhere. I couldn't have left them out there. Of course not. The last time I wore them, I was studying. In that tweak jacket. Yeah, the same one he had on yesterday. The same one he tossed on the ground when he got that brilliant idea about hiding the body. He left him there like a calling card, didn't he, Teddy? Huh? I didn't drop them. You picked my coat up, you grabbed it up by the tail and tossed it to me. That's when they fell out. I agree it was inexcusable to have them oh, in my pocket, but I didn't Oh, he agrees with us, Teddy. Isn't that lovely? He agrees it was all our fault. We said dump the body in the lake, but no, he had a stroke of genius. Shove the kid in the culvert, he said. Nobody will ever find him there. No, not in a million years, he said. Artie, will you please stop that? Shut up, we're not talking to you. The first guy by on his way to work pulled him out of that stinking culvert. Why do you suppose he picked the culvert, Teddy? Huh? Because he was scared and it was the first place handy? Yeah, I think you're right. And you know what else I think? I think he never wanted to go through with it anyway. That's not true and you know it, Artie. We agreed it was the true test of the superior intellect. Superior intellect? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of that, Teddy? You and I work out this perfect... Beautiful crime. And then the superior intellect tries to see how many ways he can... Shh. I heard some loud voices. I... Well, what are you doing with all this stuff? I was looking for something. At two o'clock in the morning? What were you looking for? I don't I'm think that's any sorry if we disturbed you, Max, but uh, Judd was looking for a corkscrew I loaned him. But he was just going to drive me home anyway, weren't you, Judd? Drive you? It's two blocks. But the neighborhood's swarming with kidnappers and degenerates. Max, you wouldn't want to be responsible for anything happening to me, would you? Or would you? What's that for? Protection. Teddy? <laughs> I always take him along. He's indispensable. Cute? And girls always get a big kick out of him anyway. Coming, Judd? I'll be back in five minutes. Or what? (sighs) 
I don't know how I could have been so stupid. You were. I could go in and claim the glasses tomorrow. Tell them I read about them in the papers. Uh-huh. But you go out to the park a lot? With my students, sure. I don't have to know when I drop them. Ah, you'd butch it up. As I say, Sergeant, I take my birding classes to the park very often. And there's just a possibility that birding I might drop Birding classes, Steiner? Hey, what are you, some uh, kind of nut or something? I happen to be an ornithologist, Sergeant, with special permission from the Department of Parks to take my classes on field trips. Oh, I see. And uh, that's how you figure you lost the glasses, huh? It's possible. That uh, uh, wouldn't have been uh, Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday? about 6 oh, o'clock, no, would it? I remember it particularly, because it was just about that time that a friend of mine and I picked up a couple of girls on Lakeshore Drive. They said their names were May and Edna, but I... Betty and Edna, you idiot. No, Artie. We agreed on May and Edna. I know we did. And we picked them up on Lakeshore Drive, right by the aquarium. So what difference does it make? So, Pat, nobody will believe it. When you start remembering details like that, they know it's an alibi. But it's all we've got. Suppose they pick me up and question me. You promised you'd stick by it. You swore you would. All right. I'll stick to it. For a week. One week and not a minute longer. After that, I'll make up my own alibi. Stop worrying. It's not that easy to trace an ordinary pair of glasses. But suppose they do. And suppose it is more than a week. So what? They're not my glasses. by investigating the neighborhood around the school, Lieutenant? Well, I guess we'll just have to start right at the beginning and see whether anybody noticed anything at all. Have you checked hey, the Sid. teachers or the principal? Hi, Artie. What's going on? Well, they know the boy was in school on Wednesday. He never got home, so they think he might have been picked up along here somewhere. Nobody saw nothing unusual, Lieutenant, uh, except one old dame. Thinks there was a big black sedan cruising around. When? When the kids got out of school. Well, what time? If uh, you're talking about Polly Kessler, officer, that would be about uh, 410. The older kids stay on the playground until 5. How do you happen to know so much about it? I, I went here for six years. Oh, that's right, Lieutenant. This is Artie Strauss. He goes to the graduate school with me. Oh, well, I'd like to talk to you for a minute, Artie. Sure, Lieutenant. Come on over here, will you? Excuse us. Well, let's well, get a statement. Just stay, just stay right where you are uh, for a minute, will you, fellas? How long ago has it been since you went here? Uh, four years ago. Four? Oh, I, I went to college at 14, oh. University of Michigan. Well, I don't suppose the place has changed much in four years. Uh, are they pretty strict here? Did they keep a pretty close watch on the kids? Oh. Uh, do you ever notice any strange characters hanging around, like after school, I mean? Oh, no, the teachers wouldn't allow that. Oh. And uh, the police are very efficient out here. Uh. Well, what about the teachers? Any oddballs? <laughs> Most of them, if you ask me, Lieutenant. Yeah? Like who, for instance? Oh, uh... Well, Mr. Henderson was one. Always telling us we were spoiled brats and too much money. You know, that kind of... Yeah. Is he still here? Why, sure. He's right over... Uh... Gosh, Lieutenant, you don't think he had anything to do with Pauline? No, no. Which one did you say he was? The, uh... The guy with the sweatshirt. Just throwing the ball. Henderson, huh? Any others? Well, uh... Pop Wigan. Uh, that's the, the, the gray-haired one. I guess you wouldn't say he was exactly normal. <laughs> Snapping towels at kids in the gym, stuff like that. But, uh, that, that wouldn't mean anything. No, no. Wigan, huh? Wigan. With an N. It's the place where I discovered the Kirtland Warbler. I was the first person to find one in 60 years. Of course, it doesn't exactly compare with Red Grange running 97 yards for a touchdown. I think it does. I think it's fascinating. I'd love to go out there sometime. You would? Yes. Really? Yes, I would. I'm going out Thursday afternoon. 
you'd like to come. I, I know how interested you are, but an inquest is strictly official business. Look, why don't you talk to your friend, Lieutenant Johnson? Maybe he'll get you in. Great, I never Party. thought of it. Hi, Ruthie. I'll see if I can find Party. him. I'm busy. I guess I'd better run along. You'll never catch up with that skyrocket. It's not that. I have some studying to do. You have time. Please stay. Sure. Stick around. Sorry, I have to go. I do hope you'll be able to make it Thursday. I know I'm late. I got tied up at the globe. Sid, you could have at least been polite to him. First, Artie brushes him off, and then you treat him as if he's some piece of the furniture. Okay, honey, I'm sorry. Now, what's this about Judd and Thursday? He wants to take me out to Hegwish Park. Hmm. Well, if you're an ornithologist, I guess that's the best place to go to find various species of birds. Should be a very entertaining afternoon for you, watching uh, Judd and all the other strange oh, birds. stop it, Sid. Judd isn't as strange as you're making him out to be, and I really don't think he's that different from any other boy. Hmm? Yeah, I guess he isn't, but... But what? Well, you know, birds, a genius IQ, graduate school at 19. I just don't get the feeling he's going to challenge Dempsey for the title. Just because he can speak about something besides sex, you and Artie and all the rest of you seem to think he's some kind of freak. Look, honey, for all I know, he's another Casanova. I just don't think I'm going to have to worry about you in Hegwish Park. Come on, keep these folks up on the sidewalk, will you, officer? Come on, let's break it up here. Come on, up there, please. You too, Mr. Oh, hello, Artie. Everybody and his brother wants to get underfoot. Sure looks that way. Well, what's going on, Lieutenant? Ah, uh, somebody phoned in, said they saw some mysterious man throw a bundle in the sewer here on Wednesday night. So we gotta dig it up. That's pretty stupid, huh? Sure is. I'd like to get my hands on the guy that called. Listen. You know anybody around here talks with a German accent? With a what? With a German accent. Oh, a German accent. Yeah, uh, the, the Wainwrights live right across the street there, have a German chauffeur. Real Prussian. Rupert. Yeah? I think I'll have a little chat with this Rupert. Hey, Johnson. What? Find anything? Sure, just what you'd expect to find in a sewer. Now, this case gets nuttier day by day. I wonder if there's any place I can find a phone around here. Well, you're the one in my house, Mr. Daly. I live right here. Come on. You know, I have another theory I was telling the lieutenant about. Hey, you and Johnson are really running this case, aren't you? No, I've just given them a couple of ideas. You see, nobody's thought of the possibility of the kidnapper being a woman. But I remember a nurse that the Kesslers had for Polly. She did some of the weirdest things you ever saw. I used to watch her at night. Yeah? How? playing cards. If they knew you were reporters, they'd be all over you. Our phone's right over there, Mr. Daly. Oh, thanks. Uh, would, would you like a drink? Why not? Yeah. Sit, come here. Stay, 10970. Okay, hold it. Now, uh, watch this. Hey, all pre-war, too. Uh, what would you like to drink, Mr. Daly? If it's pre-war, I wouldn't know the difference. Uh, give me Ryan. Let's see, uh, Scott, Scott Jarrett said it's 12 years old. Great. What do you uh, think about that nursemaid, Sid? I think she'd sweat as much as the school teachers. Now, wait a minute. You surely don't think I told the lieutenant about them just to get them in trouble, do you? Well, they got into it just the same. Think the school will take them back? But, gee, I, I hadn't thought of that. But that was a terrible thing for me to do, wasn't it? Well, not if there were any chance of them being guilty. Well, even so, that's just... Okay, uh... Carter, bye. Anything new, Mr. Daly? Oh, not much. 
police are so desperate they're looking for anybody who even had mud on their shoes last Wednesday night. Thanks. Oh, uh, they did make a positive identification of the typewriter that was used to write the ransom note. Oh, the, uh, the, the, the corona they wrote about. No, it was um, an Underwood portable with a bent key. They're sure of it. Oh, for pity's sake, you scared the life out of me. Sorry, Mumsy. These are friends of mine. We didn't want to disturb you. Reporters working on the Kessler case. This is Mr. Daly. How do you, How do you do? Mr. Sid Brooks. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, I've been telling them my theory about Margaret, Mumsy. You remember her? Margaret? Mm hmm Margaret. You've had so many theories, dear. He's done nothing but talk about the case ever since it happened. Oh, such a terrible thing. And so tragic for the poor Kesslers. Uh, Arthur, dear, get me the sherry, will you? Mrs. Bainbridge is in such a state, she has to have something for her nerves. Oh, we're all on edge, I guess. This horrible thing. Police digging up the street out there. And that crowd making such a racket you can't hear yourself think. I declare I expect the next thing they'll do will be to search this house. Thank you, dear. Well, they have to follow up every clue, Mrs. Strzok. Of course they do. And they should. None of us will get a wink's sleep until this fiend has been captured. Every one of us has children and... Mrs. Strauss, have you any idea why the Kesslers were the victims? Not the slightest. And Polly was such a handsome little boy. <laughs> yeah, but still, if you were looking for a kid to kidnap, Polly's just the kind of cocky little punk you'd pick. Ah, but that's a terrible thing to say. But it's Simply the truth, Mumsy. You said yourself he was a fresh little smart aleck who I've said the same thing about every child in this neighborhood, including you, Arthur Strauss. That doesn't mean you have to repeat it. What will these gentlemen think of me? I think you've been very gracious, Mrs. Strauss, but I also think we're imposing on you. He said? Yeah. My pleasure, Mrs. Strauss. Bye, Mrs. Strauss. Goodbye. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, wouldn't you like to stay for dinner? No, thanks, Artie. I'm going to start checking on that nursemaid. Well, I'll go with you. I, I can tell you what she looked uh, like. That really won't be necessary, Artie. Thanks just the same. Arthur, dinner's in an hour. You know how your father likes to have you here. Yes. So long, Artie. See you in the morning, Artie. Arthur, don't drink any more before dinner. You know how it affects you. How? Don't pout, dear. You should go and call Judd. He's been trying to get in touch with you all afternoon. Who cares? I'll call him after dinner. Then come and see the ladies. They're dying to meet you. And they'd be fascinated to hear what you know about the case. Oh? Okay. Oh, that's my good boy. Central 1099. Where'd you get that typewriter, Steiner? Why, I've had it for some time. Why do you ask? Not bad, Jetsy. Not bad at all. I was just trying to get you, you damn fool. Me? I don't keep an Underwood portable with a bent key. Didn't I tell you to get rid of that thing? Now they've made a positive identification of it. Suppose they suddenly decide to search all the houses in the neighborhood, huh? If you think it's that important, I'll get rid of it. It is? I'll find a place for it. And leave another pair of glasses? I've seen enough of your hiding places. This time I'll do it myself. Tomorrow afternoon, maybe. We could drive out by the uh, stockyard. Not tomorrow afternoon. Oh, you got another date? You ditching me for some girl? I haven't been able to find you for three days. I've been doing exactly what we said, watching the cops run around in circles. Who's the girl? Ruth? <laughs> Good, Ruth. You gonna take a birdie? Eggwish? She said she was interested. Good idea. We'll have her out there all alone, huh? No witnesses? You'll be perfectly safe. Girls never talk about it afterwards. She can scream her head off. You can... Oh, what's the matter? Isn't that what you plan? No, it isn't. You're not falling for her, are you, Jed? Of course not. I just hadn't thought of that. But this is your chance. Now, look. We agreed to explore all the possibilities of human experience, didn't we? Unemotionally detached. Put together, Artie. Sure, but I've done things alone. You can, too. 
Don't tell me you haven't got the nerve. It's perfect. And the best part is that Ruth won't be suspecting a thing. What's the matter? Want me to order you to, Jack? Right up in the top branch. I can't. Oh, wait, I saw something move. That's it. Here. Yes, there. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm. So glad you brought me here, Judd. What is it, Judd? You seem so sad. That's a sentimental term. There's no such thing as sadness. Only the reality of things happening. You don't really believe that, Judd. Over there, for instance. That's where they found the body of the Kessler boy. Is that sad? Yes, it is. Terribly sad. Is it sad that you're here, all alone with me? Just you and I and little Polly Kessler's ghost. You shouldn't joke about that. Why not? What's one life, more or less? There were nine million people killed in the war. What does one little Chicago boy matter? Judd, you're not that cruel. No. No. Murder's nothing. It's just a simple experience. Murder and rape. Do you know what beauty there is in evil? Is there? Yes. You tried to frighten me, Judd. If you were to move now, why don't you run? Is that what you want me to do? Yes. Do you have to attack me, Judge? I don't have to do anything. If I attack you, it's because I choose. No! Ah! Are you afraid of me? I'm afraid for you, Judd. I'm afraid for you. Judd. Oh, God. Oh, my God. I'm so ashamed. Artie? What is it? A Judas goat. Didn't you ever see one? No, what does it do? Watch and you'll find out. See, when they get to the slaughterhouse, he decks to one side and the silly sheep go in to get their throats cut. That black devil knows it. Did you get rid of the typewriter? Uh-huh. There's a pit out back where they bury all the entrails. Nobody will go near that. So, uh, how did you make out? Oh, fun. You're pretty smug about it. But if you did, how come you're not sweating? Like after Polly, and after you found out about those stinking glasses. I just wasn't rational at the time. After thinking about it, I realized there was nothing really distinctive about them. 
There must be hundreds exactly like that. 4,200 right to be exact. I asked Lieutenant Johnson. You asked the police? Sure, why not? I figured we might as well know, so I asked Johnson why they weren't following that lead. You fool. <laughs> You're sweating again, Judsey. Why? Now we know. They can't trace 4,200 pair. They can't trace anything. The whole case will blow over in a couple of weeks. Hey, come on, let's go watch him slaughter the sheep. I looked all through my bedroom, gentlemen. I just don't understand it. I'm positive I had them last night. Have you seen those glasses of mine, Emma? The ones with the black rims on my desk, perhaps? I just cleaned your room this morning, Mr. Judd. They weren't there then. I don't think I could have lost them. They wouldn't be someplace else around the house. Well, I only use them for studying. What do you think? Moss is pretty definite about it. It's the state's attorney. He gave us orders. Mr. Horn, I'm a great admirer of his. I'm a law student, you know. You wanted to talk personally to anybody on the list who didn't have their glasses. I see. Then I expect you want to take me down to the Hall of Justice with you now. Not exactly. The Pennington Hotel, Mr. Horn's taking a suite there. Just to protect anyone he talks to. You know what the reporters would do with something like this? Of course. Very considerate. Shall we? I certainly wouldn't want you to admit something you're not sure of, Judd. But it is possible you could have dropped these out there. Yes, it is possible. If they actually were mine, sir. As I say, I very often carry them in the breast pocket of my jacket. This jacket, as a matter of fact. When I take my classes to Hegridge. And you're out there Tuesday, the day before the crime. Yes, sir. I should think you would have checked that first. There are ten members in my class, all very reputable people, I assure you. Oh, come on, Judge, you're taking this all much too seriously. We all know you're a prominent ornithologist. It's entirely logical that your glasses could have dropped. Oh, uh, I'm all right. It's funny they didn't drop out of my pocket. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, sir. But it looked like you were acting that out for a jury. Forgot you were a law student, Judd. Yes, it was rather far-fetched. Uh, do you suppose you could show us how uh, these glasses might have fallen out of your pocket? Go right ahead. Of course, the terrain is considerably different out there. Mm, of course. I suppose I could have tripped over a root or something. Like this. They didn't fall out of my pocket either. No. May I see your coat a moment? Yes, certainly. Could you have taken it off uh, because of the heat or something you wanted to do and then uh, picked it up later? Yes, but I wouldn't pick my coat up that way. Why not? I'm very careful about my clothes. Unless you were in a hurry. Unless it was dark. Well, this is all purely academic if they're not really my glasses, isn't it, sir? I don't know, of course, but I would imagine there must be a thousand pair of glasses like those right here in Chicago. The figure is about 4,000, Judd. But these happen to be your glasses. In spite of the fact they look like thousands of others, they aren't. You see, a firm in Rochester developed this new hinge. Almer Coe is their only outlet here. They sold three pairs. One to an executive who's been in Europe for a month, one to a woman in River Forest, and the third to you. Interesting. Now, how would you like to tell us about Wednesday afternoon?
must say you've given us a very detailed account of your activities, Jet. Ten times. Oh, we're very thorough. We'd like to find some way to corroborate this. You see, none of it. Uh, driving around on your Stutz Bearcat, Make Sure Drive, Jackson Park, Hot Dog Stand, Main Edna, none of it is particularly easy to check. Well, it would be if you found May and Edna. Yes, but May and Edna who? You didn't tell them your right names and they didn't tell you anything. See how it is? Look, Judd, I know how you feel about involving a friend and I appreciate your family's feelings about picking up stray girls, but you might consider my position too. I simply have to check this story. Look, Judd. I give you my word. I'll never say anything to either of your families if you tell me your friend's name. Then we can wash this all up and have you home in time for dinner. All right. I doubt that he'll ever speak to me again. But his name is Artie Strauss. Artie Strauss? And the university also. You know, he's the kid that's been helping me all along. Very interesting. If you pick him up and bring him in, he may be able to help us some more. Yes, sir. Here, I'll bring some here. Straight ahead. Come on. Open up. Hurry up. Come on. He gave us a statement? I'll give you a statement when I'm good and ready to. In the meantime, there'll be no reporters in this suite. Come on! Hey! That's better. Anything I can get you, uh, Strauss? Artie. Just make it Artie, sir. I could uh, use a cigarette if you have one. Came away so quickly that I didn't uh, sure. have one of mine. Thank you. Oh, this is Mr. Horn, Artie, the state's attorney. Uh, Mr. Artie Strauss, Strauss, sir. Uh, nice to know you, sir. I guess you're the man I want to see. Oh? Well, you see, I, I don't know exactly why I'm here. But uh, if we could make it as quick as possible. Oh, I think we can do that, Mr. Mr. Strauss. Artie, please, sir. You see, I uh, answered the door when your men arrived, and uh, since I didn't want to worry Mumsy, <laughs> my mother, that is, I, I just came along. Oh, all right. Well, this won't take but a few minutes. Oh, fine. You see, uh... Dinner's at 8.30, and Dad likes me to be on time, particularly when we're having guests. Judge uh, Conway or uh, Conroy, I think it is tonight. Well, that'll be Judge Conway of the Superior Court. <laughs> In that case, we'll make it extra brief. Uh, won't you sit down, Hardy? Well, I'd prefer to stand, if uh, you don't mind, sir, the, <laughs> the nervous type. But uh, please. Thank you. Well, I'll come right to the point, Artie. We're interested uh, in a description of your movements in the afternoon and evening of uh, Wednesday the 17th. Last Wednesday. That's uh, over a week ago, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, this is Thursday. <laughs> well, you see, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to remember that far back. That's what your friend Judd said. He did? But he managed to recall a few things. Oh, well, uh, did he say I was with him? That's hardly the point, is it, Artie? We're interested in finding out what you recall. Uh, of course. Stupid of me, isn't it? You see, I, it's just that I know we were together part of the day. When was that? Well, Wednesday's a school day, and uh, we have two of the same classes. Mm. Uh, we're interested in hearing what happened after school. Yeah. Wednesday, Wednesday. Is that the day the old man, uh, father had the dinner party? For... Wednesday was the night the little Kessler boy was kidnapped. Is that why you want to know? Then I better get it right. Wednesday. It may help if you recall being with Judd any afternoon and evening last week. Well, I, 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 know, I know we went to the Edgewater Beach Monday. That was a party. And the Ford Deuces Friday. No, Thursday. But Wednesday. I don't believe so. Oh, yeah. I remember. I went to the movies. Alone. And that's all you remember about Wednesday night? 
Just dropping into a movie alone. No friends, no girls. That's it, sir. I wish I could tell you something more helpful. Yeah. Well, the commissioner just phoned. He wanted me to tell you that Judge Conway called him. For the family, sir. So? Well, nothing. He just wanted me to tell you. All right. You told me. Yes, sir. Oh, Johnson. Yeah. What about that other matter? Oh, man, Edna? Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, the two dames. Well, uh, we're still working on that, sir. Mm. Did he say something about two girls named May and Edna? Oh, I don't know if that's their names. Uh, two girls we interviewed as secretaries. That's not true, Mr. Horn. Judd's broken his word of honor to me. He promised he'd never tell it to anybody. Why, Artie? Well, well because that's... That's where we were Wednesday night. How about a... With a couple of chippies we picked up on Lakeshore Drive. He knows what'll happen if my family finds out. Well, what else did he tell you that we... Artie, with... have you been lying? Don't you know this is a murder case? Do you realize what the consequences could be? Can't be as bad as what my old man will do. He'll skin me alive if he finds out I was out with a couple of tramps. He doesn't need to find out. Do you want to tell us about it now? Didn't that blabbermouth tell you enough? We'd like to hear it from you. All right. Well, look, it, 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 it wasn't so much anyway. We, look, we were just out, out cruising in Judd Stutz and, and we saw these two tramps, May and Edna, they said their names were. <laughs> A couple of crows. Anyway, I uh, wound up with Edna and Judd was left with, yeah. Yeah. Follow them on what? Roller skates? They just went down the freight elevator and took off. Yeah, well, Johnson says that Horn took them to dinner. Maybe he did. I got the kid making the rounds of all the restaurants in the neighborhood. Yeah, well, the feeling is that there's nothing much to it, particularly since they were taken out to dinner. Yeah. No, that's right, I'll let you know. Here we are, Mr. Judd. Will this be satisfactory? Excellent, mon père, merci. Hey, monsieur, votre père. Il se porte bien, j'espère. Est-ce que ce n'est pas que ça? On te vient de la livre femme, Kinder. Danke. Wie immer sind Sie alle wohl auf. Gut. Préparez-nous son bon dîner, s'il vous plaît, et servez-le d'aussi tôt que possible. Mais bien sûr, je m'en charge. Comptez sur moi. Merci. I told Robert about the forest, Mr. Horn. I assure you it'll be excellent. How many languages do you speak, John? Fourteen, including English and German and Italian and French, Sanskrit, Russian, Latin, Greek. That's classical Greek and modern Greek, Umbrian. I expect to brush up on some of them in Europe this summer. Europe? Yes, I plan to leave next week. Europe, Stutz Bearcat, the best restaurants. You fellows really have a hard life, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that Stutz is a two-seater, isn't it? <laughs> I thought you'd uh, be wise to that one, Mr. Horn. You see, in a two-seater, a girl has to sit in your lap. <laughs> oh, cozy. <laughs> you, know, you boys really had us worried there for a while, especially you, Artie. I'm sorry, sir, but... Uh... I didn't think Judd was going to back out of our agreement. If uh, you'll excuse me, I think I'll wash up. I'll join you. Might as well go, too. Mr. Horn, it uh, looks as if you're still not quite certain. Oh, don't be silly. Sit down, Davis. I don't think they had anything to do with it. Mm, I don't know. The story's tally, but what do you think, Whitey? These kids? A couple of powder puffs. They're too afraid of their fathers to do anything. And far too intelligent. If they'd have come up with the same stories right away, I might have thought something was fishy, but... Anyway, how long can you hold them? There's the commissioner, Judge Conway, the family. I know, I know, I know. I wish I was as sure as you are, but... Those damn glasses keep bothering me. Here they come! Hey! Oh, hey, 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 story here because there have been no charges. Oh, wait, 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 wait.
You know, they're right, Chief. We can't hold them much longer without a charge. I'm surprised the families haven't sent a lawyer down here before all this. All right, time. all right, all right, I'll release them. Oh, I've kept them as long as I have, except... No, never mind. Who's this? He's a Steiner chauffeur. Albert, sir. Mr. Steiner sent me. I brought pajamas and a few toilet articles for Mr. Judd in case you kept him overnight. Hmm. That's subtle. Well, Mr. Judd won't need them. You can stay here and drive him home. I knew all along the boys couldn't have done it. How? Well, I mean, they couldn't have been anywhere near Hedwish Park unless they walked. Mr. Judd Stutz was in the garage all afternoon. The Stutz Bearcat? Wednesday? Yes, sir. I know, because Wednesday is my afternoon off. I stayed home to change the brake linings. You're sure it was Wednesday? Yes, sir, I'm sure. Well, of course you're sure. Thank you very much, Albert. I wish we'd known this before. Thank you. So they were cruising around in the Stutz Bearcat Wednesday, were they picking up girls? Well, the little devils, they almost had us believing them. That still doesn't prove they, they had anything they to... They lied, and this time I'm going to get the truth. Which one will we hit with it first? Well, it's Judd's car. Yeah, but Artie's the wise guy. Johnson's buddy, nice and cocky. I'll bust him apart at the seams. You go in there and keep Judd happy. How do you feel after your dinner? A little sleepy. Oh, really? Well, it's the shank of the evening. It's all over, Steiner. Your partner's confessed everything. Oh, come now, Mr. Horn. Isn't this the sort of thing they do in detective stories? You can hardly expect me to be taken in by that, even if there was something to confess. Yes, I guess it was rather stupid of me at that. You might also have taken into consideration that aside from the fact that he's my best friend, Artie is far too intelligent to... To be trapped by us poor specimens? I suppose so. But uh, Artie was such a good friend of a young man who helped him write a ransom note on a stolen typewriter and uh, who rented a black sedan from the Collins Drive Yourself Agency on May 16th that uh, I thought it might joggle your memory. Do you take me for an idiot? Let's see, what did he say about that car? Oh, yes. I drove it. Judd Steiner was sitting in the back seat with Polly Kessler. I don't know how it happened, but Polly started to struggle. Judd told him to be quiet, and then he hit him. He hit him very hard. Oh, that weakling. That child. That inferior weakling. Where is he? Poland. He said that he's lying. It's a cheap, cowardly lie. Mr. Strauss didn't drive the car I did. And I didn't kill Polly. Mr. Strauss did. He's lying. He's lying. There's only one man for this case. He's the best lawyer in the country. And he's here in Chicago. That atheist? I won't have him. He's a skeptic who makes a mockery of religion. And the best trial lawyer in the country. A charlatan. A lying, drunken jury swear. But a winner. And he's fought capital punishment all his life. I'm not even sure he'll take the case. If, if it's a question of money, we can... But the fee must be a consideration. I've known him 30 years. It never has been. Will you let me get him on the phone and see if I can persuade him? No. Judd is my son. No matter what he's done, it's my duty to speak for him. Give me information. I want 
note the number of Jonathan Wilk. W-I-L-K. Judd cleaned up most of it, and I helped him. When it was as clean as we could get it, we got in the car and drove for a while. Then we started back, and coming along Ellis Avenue, I threw the taped chisel into the bushes at the side of the road. Then Judd drove me home, and I went to bed. These are the facts to the best of my recollection. Signed, Arthur A. Strauss. Do you have anything to add to that? Artie. Judd. With the exception of saying that I killed Polly, Mr. Strauss has done such a brilliant job, no one could think of adding anything to it. If Mr. Steiner hadn't involved me in that asinine alibi, there wouldn't have had to be a confession. And as far as killing the kid goes, I was sitting in the back seat where... I mean the front seat. The front seat hey, the back. All right, I met All right, the front. boys. I haven't finished. Have you both been treated fairly by me? Yes. No violence, no intimidation. No. That's all. You'll have five minutes to question them. Well, Jonathan. Harold. I suppose I should have realized you'd appear sooner or later. Would have been sooner. I hadn't gone first to city jail, which is where I normally expect to find my clients. May we put my question Fine. here in an effort to avoid publicity? Avoid publicity? Well, they congratulations. Counsel at the time. Well, they've I got know... a counsel now, one with a writ for immediate delivery to city jail. I was about to do that before you came in. Take him down in the freight elevator and out oh, through the back. Oh, wait a minute. You had him for 12 hours. Can you please spare me 12 seconds? You are Arnie? Yes. Judd? Yes, sir. Your folks have retained me as counsel for the defense. I've always admired you tremendously, Mr. Wood. You Will. can prove it, both of you by saying absolutely nothing to anybody until I instruct you to the contrary. That's it, Harold. Let's go. Come on, boy. Hold it up, everybody. It's a little late to silence them now, isn't it? We do what we can. I suppose I ought to consider it a minor victory that the boys weren't hanged before I got here. <laughs> they will be soon enough. Luckily, that decision won't be up to you, Harold. Oh, you may as well know, before you decide on a plea, mm. Dr. Ball and Dr. Stauffer have been observing them. Observing? In their opinion, the boys are completely sane might be more interesting to hear their conclusions. The doctors would observe each other. Sid. Is it true, Sid? Yes, it is. Oh, I just can't believe it. Well, you can believe it, all right. And the confessions they signed will take them right to the gallows. Oh, my God. But look, Ruth, be sensible. I mean, they're murderers. How do you think the Kessler family feels? I know how they must feel, Sid. But I can't help feeling sorry for Judd and for Artie. Sorry for them, Ruth. They plotted a cold-blooded killing and went through with it like an experiment in chemistry. Sid, Judd isn't like that. Believe me, I know. How do you know? Will you just believe that I know? No, I won't just believe you. Something must have happened. Well, did it? Well, did something happen?
He tried to attack me. Dirty little degenerate. Please. It wasn't the way you think at all. He made an attempt at it. He couldn't go through with it, Sid. He was like a child. A sick, frightened child. I don't understand you, Ruth. He tries to rape you. And you defend him. I know. It's difficult to understand. But see, you weren't there. You didn't see him like I did, Sid. If you did, you'd have some compassion or sympathy for him. Sympathy. Believe me. Ruth, you sound as though you're sorry he didn't go through with it. I hope they hang him. I hope he hangs till the rope rots. Said he pleaded him not guilty. That's right, not guilty. The Chief Justice set the trial date for four weeks from the day. Look, wanted more time. But police, coming in now. I'll call you back. You mean you're actually going to conduct a psychiatric study on them? With the best men in the profession. Why, Mr. Wilk? Sure, to determine the facts. Have they got the facts? And haven't the state psychiatrists already pronounced them sane? Indeed, they have. The state psychiatrists have pronounced them completely sane. Uh, it's after a searching and exhaustive study, isn't that right, Harold? Ten minutes in a crowded hotel room. Oh, we're up against some brilliant minds in this case, so we, we don't have a minute to lose. If you'll excuse me, gentlemen. Well, 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 definitely will be based on insanity, won't well, it? Now, we'd be pretty stupid, wouldn't we, to divulge our tactics to the prosecution? The defense will be based on the results of the study. Plus, we'd be glad to join forces with Mr. Horn's psychiatrist. <laughs> no? Too bad, Harold. Might have been a real contribution to criminology. That's the way you feel about it. Good day, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Mr. Horace, why right. do you object to joining forces? My very interesting. Joint study of what? Two evil minds that don't deserve to live a day longer? Do you really think these boys don't know the difference between right and wrong? That's the legal definition of insanity in the state, and no team of psychiatrists is going to change it. situation is to pull a sheet over the head. Any, hey, uh, any comments on this fiery cross business, Mr. Wilk? It's much too warm for an open fire. Are you worried about getting an impartial jury after this, Mr. Wilk? I've been worried about juries for more than 40 years. But, Mr. Wilk, with public Why feeling not? the way it is, don't yeah. you think this is a hopeless case, even for you? Yeah, that's what I keep reading in your newspapers, but I'd rather leave the final decision to a judge, not your editors. Mr. Wilk, it's common knowledge you take more than half your cases without a fee. No offense, sir, but is it true you're getting a million dollars for this one? Yeah, how about yeah, it's been a matter of public record for two weeks now. The State Bar Association will determine the fee. Well, if the fee isn't that important, sir, why take the case? Well, I, I did give it some thought, but you know, it occurred to me that to deny the rich the same right of defense as the poor might be to go along with the same kind of thinking that started that fire. Hmm? Morning, gentlemen. Thank you. Morning. Thank you. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Stanford Beanish scale doesn't run high enough to make Judge IQ. Can you imagine that? 
And yet on several others, both he and Artie showed no more emotional maturity than seven-year-old. It's amazing, isn't it? Well, I find lack here any conclusions. Yes, well, we had several days' discussion about that, and most of us agree that Judd is paranoid and Artie schizophrenic. But not enough to be declared medically insane? Well, that's a very indefinite term, Mr. Wilk. We prefer not to use it. It's very indefinite in a court of law. Of course. And that's why we prefer you to draw your own conclusions. Thanks, Doc. Based on your legal knowledge, of course. Uh, of course. And I have to add that uh, none of us is in complete agreement. Oh, well, that's going to be very helpful. Intensely interesting. These have been the most fascinating four weeks I've ever spent. Do you think that'll be a major contribution to criminology? Well, I'd hardly say that, Judd. Why don't you tell him the truth? It all adds up to six feet of rope and a hang. No, no, no. This report might be useful. <laughs> They're betting 20 to 1 we hang. If it's the long shot you're looking for, I've got one just as good. You know that guard that brings us up here every day? He's got a sick wife, five kids, and a house they're gonna throw him out of. I know, I talked to him. For $5,000, he could be looking the other way when we come past the admitting desk. <laughs> Three steps, we're outside. There's a car waiting with a motor running. Uh, and a mad dash to the Canadian border, are they? Okay, so we do it your way and go to trial in the morning. Oh, well, still one subject that concerns me. The newspapers have been pointing it out. The state's attorney may try to do something with it. <clears throat> it's the fact that, aside from each other, you don't have any close friends. We didn't have any other friends because there was no one of sufficient intelligence and maturity worth cultivating. Is there anything wrong in that? Nothing, unless the state's attorney wants to make something of it with hostile witnesses. If he calls him, I'd like to have somebody speak for you. I'll give you a flock of them. I've got a little black book in my desk at home. The cops haven't taken it. It's got the addresses of 40, 50 girls I've been out with in the last two years. Ask any one of them what she thinks of me. No, I haven't any little black book. No girls? Yes, there is one I've been out with lately. I don't know what she'd say. You want to give me your name? Ruth Evans. But I'd sooner you didn't call her, sir. I don't want her involved in this. I won't call her without your permission. That's it, boys. Mr. Will, can I ask you one thing? Uh, will Mumsy be... Uh, my mother be there? And Dad? <laughs> Why? What am I talking about? Tuesday, the old lady has the bridge club, and the old man's got his regular date at the country club. Suckers to sit in a crummy courtroom on this one. There is no other justice. There is no other verdict. There is no other penalty. Because never before in the history of this city has such a vile, cold, Brutal, inexcusable, premeditated murder been committed. Gentlemen of the jury, my office, representing the outraged citizens of Cook County, dedicates itself to presenting the evidence in this case in such a manner 
that the perpetrators of this crime shall be convicted and hanged as swiftly as possible. Any further disturbance of this nature, and I shall order the bailiffs to clear the court. Defense will make its opening remarks to the jury. Your Honor, please, defense will waive its remarks to the jury. The court will approve the intent at this time to change the plea to guilty. What? We're changing the plea to guilty with mitigating circumstances. It took six days to impanel that jury. Don't worry, I'll have that jury back at the mitigating circumstances even sound like insanity. State's attorney will approach the bench, please. The court accepts your change of plea to guilty for the defense, Mr. Wilk. Before I dismiss the jury, may I see both of you gentlemen in chambers? Be a short recess. And unless you've completely lost your faculties, sir, I demand an explanation for this fantastic well, about face. Mr. Strauss, Mr. Strauss, Mr. Strauss, Mr. Strauss has every right to question my judgment. I've taken a big responsibility. If I'm going to persuade anybody of the boy's emotional instability, emotional it's instability. going to be the judge alone. But we hired you on your reputation as a manipulator of jurors. Of course we did. That's your Sitting reputation. in that courtroom today. Studying that jury. We wouldn't have had a chance with him. No, Mr. Wilk. I can't understand any of this. Will what you did today help Artie? I think so, Mrs. Strauss. I hope so. I hope so. You see. Here in Illinois, when you plead guilty, you don't have to have a jury. And that means that I'll be talking just to the judge. I hope he'll be more tolerant than any jury. Oh, you hope that But I think they should one. know that if it becomes a question of actual insanity, a jury will have to decide but it. But he threw the jury out. Then the judge will have to recall a jury. But what That's else right. is a psychiatrist's testimony except insanity? Functional disorders, emotional imbalances, Don't tell me psychotic what. They are also insane or they are not. A sane person can't commit an insane act. And after what you Mr. did today. Mr. Strauss, I'll understand if you rather have another lawyer. No, no sir. Another lawyer. Now? The best kind. Between now and 9 o'clock tomorrow morning? Ridiculous. No. We're committed to you, sir. And I think we've made a tragic mistake. I hope you're wrong. I really do, Mr. Steiner. I object. I object, Your Honor. I object. I've said it ten times, and I say it again. The moment you admit evidence on insanity, no, this becomes a mock so trial. Far, nobody's mentioned insanity except you, Your Honor. All the defense is asking is a chance to present expert testimony on the mental condition of these two boys. As a mitigating circumstance. Well, Your Honor. It's just another word for insanity. Well, no, it's not. And that evidence has to be presented Your to Honor, a jury. Uh, Mr. Horn was virtually godlike of missings and without uh, hearing a single word from Dr. Allwood has already arrived at a conclusion which the testimony of the witness may not support. Your Honor, defense counsel is making a mockery of procedure. I object to his... Objection overruled. You may take the stand, Dr. Allwood. Raise your right hand. Well, thank you, Doctor. Now, uh, can you tell us how far this tendency, what you call schizophrenia, had progressed with our distress? Not to any degree of exactitude. We do know the habit of lying, indulging in fantasies, which the boy developed in infancy, had progressed to the stage where he himself was having difficulty distinguishing between what was true and what was not true. No, that's right. Your Honor, the this prosecution moves the jury be impaneled. But why? If Artie Strauss cannot distinguish between what is true and what is not Your true, Honor. he cannot distinguish between right and wrong and is therefore insane. Isn't that what you're saying, right. Doctor? No, I don't believe so. Now, no, just Doctor, a minute. You're an expert and under oath. Is your diagnosis I am cross insanity examining or not? Witness, under oath, I cannot answer that, sir. Insanity is a legal term, not a medical one. I'm a doctor, not a lawyer. Motion denied. Your witness, Mr. Horn. Go ahead. Poppycock, Doctor. 
More psychiatric verbiage. Call it paranoia, call it anything you like. What it all adds up to in Judd Steiner is a feeling that nobody liked him. And they had good reason not to. <coughs> paranoia encompasses a very positive feeling of being right and a strong neurotic suspicion of being persecuted because of those feelings. Or it does, eh? Well, let me tell you something. For the past 10 days in cross-examining you and your colleagues, I've had exactly those feelings. I know I'm right, and I have a distinct feeling of being persecuted by the defense. Do you think I should be committed? Uh, your Honor, I submit that if uh, the subject to be debated here is Mr. Horn's sanity, for once I agree with him, uh, only a jury could determine that. <laughs> now, at the time of this meeting, you had a deep romantic attachment for another boy. Yes, sir. And yet you also feel a romantic attachment for Judd? I felt he was alone and terribly unhappy. I see. But did Judd give any demonstration that he liked you as a woman? He kissed me. That's all. No further advances. There were, but they stopped. Would you keep your voice up, Miss Evans? I couldn't hear you. But they stopped. I'm sorry, Miss Evans, but were they of such a nature as to make you determine never to see him again? No. They were not. You would have seen him again? Yes. Within a few hours after this, Judd was arrested. And did your feelings toward him change then? Of course. I realized that the unhappiness I sensed in him had caused him to commit a violent and insane crime. And with this knowledge, would you still see him again? Yes. I felt sorry for him then, and I feel sorry for him now. No further question. This crime is the most fiendish, cold-blooded, inexcusable case the world has ever known. It's what Mr. Horn has told this court. Your Honor, I've been practicing law a good deal longer than I ought to have. Anyhow, for 45, 46 years, during all that time, I've never tried a case where the state's attorney did not say it was the most cold-blooded, inexcusable case ever. Certainly, there was no excuse for the killing of little Polly Kessler. There was also no reason for it. It wasn't for spite or for hate or for money. Great misfortune of this case is money. If Your Honor shall doom these boys to die, it'll be because my parents are rich. I hope I don't need to mention that I'll fight as hard for the poor as for the rich. If I'd come into this court alone, with two ordinary, obscure defendants who've done what these boys have done, and that had been all this weirdness and notoriety and this sensational publicity. I said, Your Honor, I'm willing to enter a plea of guilty and let you sentence them to life imprisonment. Do you suppose the state's attorneys would have raised their voices in protest? There's never been a case in Chicago where in a plea of guilty, a boy under 21 has been sentenced to death. Not one. Yet for some reason, in the case of these immature boys of diseased minds, as plain as day, they say you can only get justice by shedding their last drop of blood. Isn't a lifetime behind prison bars enough for this mad act? And must this great public be regaled with the hanging? For the last three weeks, I've heard nothing but the cry of blood in this room. I've heard nothing from the offices of the state's attorney but ugly hatred. For God's sake, are we crazy? If you hang these boys, it will mean that in this land of ours, a court of law 
could not help but bow down to public opinion. As cruel a speech as he knew how to make. The state's attorney has told this court that we're pleading guilty because we're afraid to do anything else. Your Honor, that's true. So of course I'm afraid to submit this case to a jury where the responsibility must be divided by 12. No, Your Honor. If these boys must hang, you must do it. it. Must be your own deliberate, cool, premeditated act. The state's attorney has laughed at me for talking about children's fantasies. But what does he know about childhood? What do I know? Is there any one of us who hasn't been guilty of some kind of delinquency in his youth? How many men are there here today? Lawyers and congressmen, and judges, and even state's attorneys who haven't been guilty of some kind of wild act in youth. And if the consequences didn't amount to much and we didn't get caught, that was our good luck. But this was something different. This was the mad act of two sick children who belong in a psychopathic hospital. Do I need to argue it? Is there any man with a decent regard for human life and the slightest bit of heart who doesn't understand it? We're told it was a cold-blooded killing because they planned and schemed, yes, but here are officers of the state who for months have planned and schemed and contrived to take these boys' lives. Talk about scheming. Your Honor, I've become obsessed with this deep feeling of hate and anger. I've been fighting it, battling with it till it's fairly driven me mad. What about this matter of crime and punishment, anyway? Through the centuries, our laws have been modified. Till now, men look back with horror at the hangings and killings of the past. It's been proven that as the penalties are less barbarous, the crimes are less frequent. Do I need to argue with Your Honor that cruelty only breeds cruelty? That every religious leader who's held up as an example has taught us that if there's any way to kill evil, it's not by killing men. And if there's any way of destroying hatred and all that goes with it, it's not through evil and hatred and cruelty. It's through charity, love, understanding. This is a Christian community, so-called. Is there any doubt that these boys would be safe in the hands of the founder of the Christian religion? I think anyone who knows me knows how sorry I am for little Pauli Kessler. And knows that I'm not saying it simply to talk. Hardy and Judd enticed him into a car, and when he struggled, they hit him over the head and killed him. They did that. They poured acid on him to destroy his identity and put the naked body in a ditch. And if killing these boys would bring him back to life, I'd say, let them go. And I think their parents would say so, too. Neither they nor I would want them released. They must be isolated from society. I'm asking this court to shut them into a prison for life. Any cry for more goes back to the hyena. It roots back to the beasts of the jungle. There's no part of man. This court is told to give them the same mercy that they gave their victim. Your Honor, if our state is not kinder, more human, more considerate, more intelligent than the mad act of these two sick boys, then I'm sorry that I've lived so long. I know that any mother might be the mother of little Polly Kessler who left home and went to school, never came back. But I know that any mother might be the mother of Heidi Strauss, Judd Steiner. Maybe that in some ways these parents are more responsible than their children. I guess the truth is that all parents can be criticized. And these might have done better if they hadn't had so much money. I do not know. 
The state's attorney has pictured the putting of the poor little dead body in the ditch. But, Your Honor, I can only think now of taking these two boys, 18 and 19, pinning them in a cell, checking off the days and hours and minutes until they're wakened in the gray of the morning and led to the scaffold. Their feet tied, black caps drawn over their heads, stood on a trap, the hangman pressing the spring. I can see them fall through space. I can see them stopped by the rope around our necks. It would be done, of course, in the name of justice. Justice. Who knows what it is? Do I know? Does Your Honor know? Can Your Honor tell me what I deserve? Can Your Honor appraise yourself and say what you deserve? Do you think you can cure the hatreds and maladjustments of the world by hanging them? Mr. Horn says that if we hang Hardy and Judd, there, there'll be no more killing. The world has been one long slaughterhouse from the beginning until today. And the killing goes on and on and on. Why not read something? Why not think instead of blindly shouting for death? Kill. Because everybody's talking about the case. Because their parents have money. Kill them. Will that stop other sick boys from killing? today. Your Honor, if you hang these boys, you turn back to the past. I'm pleading for the future. Not merely for these boys, but for all boys, for all the young. I'm pleading not for these two lives, but for life itself. For a time when we can learn to overcome hatred with love. When we can learn that all life is worth saving. And that mercy is the highest attribute of men. Yes, I'm pleading for the future. In this court of law. I'm pleading for love. Court stands in recess until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. believe me or not. I don't know why you should. But after listening to Will, I'm glad you went on the stand. It took a lot of courage. I just wanted to tell you. Sid.
for the crime of murder to be confined in the penitentiary at Joliet for the term of your natural life. For the crime of kidnapping for ransom to be confined in the penitentiary at Joliet for 99 years. The sentence is to run consecutively. Court is adjourned. So we sweat through three months of misery just to hear that. I wish they'd have hung us right off the bat. Is that your only reaction, Artie? No remorse, no feeling of remorse. I wasn't expecting you to fall down on your knees and thank God for deliverance. God? That sounds rather strange coming from you, Mr. Will. A lifetime of doubt and questioning doesn't necessarily mean I've reached any final conclusions. Well, I have. And God has nothing to do with it. You sure, Judd? In those years to come, you might find yourself asking if it wasn't the hand of God dropped those glasses. And if he didn't, who did? <laughs>